Well, hello, Storyline, wherever you happen to be in the world tuning in for our study of the book of Ephesians. I once knew a guy who wanted to be married very badly. I mean, very badly. So he did what any logical, purely rational guy would do. He assessed every girl in his community, every girl he knew, by composing a pros and cons list on each one. And once he discovered the girl that had the most pros and the least cons, well, he did what was logically the next thing to do. He approached the girl with the list and a Bible verse. He quoted to her Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. By the time I met this guy, he had been through eight different girls with this methodology, and he was completely baffled as to why it wasn't working. I mean, it's easy, it's logical, it's straight and to the point, but it will ensure failure. There is no success, and he was baffled by this. He was like, why? I mean, come on, don't they want to do the right thing? Don't they want to obey God? Don't they want to be fruitful and multiply? Well, I said to him, maybe they want to do all of that stuff, but what they want to do more than anything else is they want to fall in love, and you're not even offering that as an option. This guy said to me the words, probably not realizing he was quoting a Tina Turner song, he said, what's love got to do with it, Ty? He was purely rational in his approach, purely logical in his approach. He thought that he was exercising wisdom with his pros and cons list and leveraging a Bible verse on the particular female that he had chosen eight times in a row to utter failure. I want to explore with you in our time together from our Ephesians series. We're moving through power dynamics and we have now come to Ephesians chapter 3 and part 4 of our entire series together. Part 1, of course, was an overview and an introduction to the book. We're now in Ephesians chapter 3, and what we're going to discover is that love is a long game relational dynamic. Love is a long game. That is to say, love calculates a series of steps toward long-term success. By contrast, I'm going to suggest to you that force, force of any kind, the force of pure logic, as in the case of this guy that I just told you about, the force of manipulation, the force of imposing on someone a sense of duty apart from any personal desire, the force of physically causing yourself to be the one who gets his or her way in a situation by sheer muscle. Whatever form force takes, rational force, emotional force, physical force, force is a short game. It's not sustainable. I'm going to point out that there is a law, a principle, let's call it, call it that is operating all the time in all human relationships and in God's relationship with us and ours with him. And it is this, that love is the only eternally sustainable relational dynamic. Love is the only eternally sustainable relational dynamic. Why? Because love brings logic along with relationship. You can't cancel one out in favor of the other and have a healthy relational dynamic. So let's crack into Ephesians chapter 3 by noticing that Paul first and foremost is referring back to what he's covered in chapter 2. Paul does this repeatedly where he is building one point upon another in order to construct a picture. In chapter 3 verse 1, Paul begins by saying, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for or to you Gentiles. This is fascinating. Paul is about to reason forward 
because of what he has just said previously. Now, what he's said previously is fascinating. The end of chapter two, he essentially builds a case for the idea that in the person of Christ, all barriers, all enmity, all hostility has been broken down between people groups in an objective sense. That doesn't mean that he's magically snapped his fingers and all hostility between people is gone. It means that he has in himself, in his own experience, in his own way of relating to all people, and in his very nature, Jesus now is the one man who represents all men. He has reconciled the two, in Ephesians chapter 2, the two Gentiles and Jews in one person. So Jesus is the one person who represents now all people. Objectively, as a historic achievement, perfect love is achieved in Christ for everyone. We look to Jesus and we discern the quality of that love as the true law of our nature, of our being, that we're living contrary to. All of us are out of sync with the grain of the universe as God created the universe to operate. We're going against the grain when we indulge in any divisive, hostile enmity between us and anyone else. We in Christ are called upon to break down all barriers and walls between us and others. And so it's in that context that Paul says, for this reason, for this reason, for what reason? For the reason that in Christ, all hostility is abolished. For the reason that in Christ, God's love is on full display for everyone. For this reason, I, Paul, I am a prisoner. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now remember, we've pointed out in our previous sessions together that Paul's audience is a Gentile audience predominantly. This is his letter to the Ephesians. These are individuals who do not have any background in Judaism. Certainly they have no genetic lineage within Judaism. They don't point to Abraham as their father as the Jews do. And yet Paul is saying, hey, you're in. There's one family now, and the one family is God's family, and Paul is articulating the radical inclusion that is manifested, that was manifested in the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and ascension of Christ, which Paul calls the gospel. The Christ event is the gospel because Jesus has completed, finished in himself the total package of necessary redemptive actions. Everything is done in Christ. And so for this reason, Paul says, I'm pursuing you Gentiles with the good news of God's love for you. You're in, you're included. In the outline that we're providing for our time together, you'll notice at the middle of page two, by the way, the outline can be downloaded or you can just Pull it up on your screen by going to storyline.church. You'll find it right there as you scroll down below the Power Dynamics series. So in the middle of page one of the outline, the words occur, the door of God's grace is flung. And you know the answer because you've been, you've been looking at what Paul is teaching. In Christ, the door of God's grace has been flung wide open to who? to all. Now this has implications for all of our relationships as well. It's not just that God in Christ is relating to all with an open door of acceptance and love. It's that God is relating to all in this manner so that we, each of us, will begin to relate to one another in this manner. So Paul goes on in verse 3 and he says, listen, this is a revelation the breaking down of the barrier between people groups, the elimination of the hostility, the abolishing of the enmity. This came to me, Paul says, by revelation. 
I didn't deduce this logically on my own. I didn't study scripture and arrive at this by some kind of deductive logic on my own. He says, it was revealed to me. Jesus came to Paul and literally selected him and said, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to reveal something to you. And what I'm going to reveal to you is that in me, in my person, as the Messiah, all are accepted in me, in the beloved, looping back to chapter 1 of Ephesians. So he says, by revelation, he, that is Jesus, made known to me the mystery. Here he calls it a mystery, and I want to just point out that it's not a mystery. God's love for everybody is not a mystery because God has deliberately kept it a secret. It's not like God is playing hard to get. He's not going out of his way to make it difficult to understand. No, it's a mystery because of the barriers that are erected in the human heart and mind by means of our guilt and shame. Guilt has the effect of causing me to find somebody else to blame in order to not face what's going on inside of myself. I judge and condemn you in order to get the heat off of my own conscience. This is a pervasive truth of the New Testament. So God wasn't making the gospel mysterious. The gospel was made mysterious by human beings concocting around it all kinds of laws and rules and stipulations and hurdles and doors that were slammed shut in people's faces unless they somehow measured up to the standard that was being forced upon them by the religious teachers and leaders of the time. Jesus came along and he rebuked all of that wall building in favor of bridge building. Jesus came along and he tapped Paul on the shoulder, who was himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul had perfected the art of exclusion. Paul viewed himself as one of the elite over against, and in contrast to all of the rest of y'all who aren't the elite. Paul had perfected the art of separatism and division, and he persecuted the church because the church was opening the door to everybody. But then Jesus tapped Paul on the shoulder. You can read the story in the book of Acts. And he said, Paul, you who have perfected the art of exclusion, religious exclusion in the name of God, you who are engaging in the persecution of my people who are trying to open the door of God's love to everybody, you, Paul, I'm choosing you, and I'm going to reveal to you the mystery that has been hidden from your mind and from so many other people's minds, especially within the, the minds of the religious teachers, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the elite. Now, here, Paul says, Jesus told me something. He revealed something to me, and he calls it the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of Christ in Paul's language here in chapter 3 of Ephesians verse 4? What is the mystery of Christ? Well, he's already in chapters 1 and 2 built a case for what this mystery entails. This thing that is hazy and foggy and our minds don't readily grasp it because our own guilt drives us to exclude others. What is the mystery of Christ? Well, Christ is the one human that represents all humans. Now, Paul's logic on this is amazing. He's essentially saying that if God accepts you, it logically follows that you should accept others. Paul's reasoning is that if God has been merciful to you, it logically follows that you should be merciful to others. If God has embraced you as his son, as his daughter, you should view all other human beings as your siblings in Christ, as your brothers and sisters. Doesn't matter who they are, 
It doesn't matter their ethnicity, their language, their nationality. All are represented in Christ. And this is the mystery of Christ. And this is very clear what Paul means when you come to verse 6 of chapter 3 when he says that the mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Fellow heirs with who? Well, with the Jews, with the Israelites, who were claiming the monopoly on God's favor. Paul is essentially saying there is no monopoly on God's favor. Because why? Because God's favor is a gift of grace. By virtue of the fact that you can't do anything to earn it, means that it must be a universal reality. God is love and he loves you and me and everyone you and I don't love. The person you love least is loved by God with precisely the same quality of love with which God loves you. So Paul's reasoning is that the mystery of Christ is that the, is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with Israel of the same body, of the same body. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, the same body. And they are partakers of his promise. This is a reference to the covenant promise made by God to Abraham for the whole world that had been misinterpreted as an exclusive blessing and promise that is only for genetic Jews. Paul comes along and he says, away with that thinking. The promise is in Christ for all, and this has been proclaimed, it's been revealed to me, Paul says, and he says, this is the gospel. This is the good news. The good news is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of the covenant promise made to and through Abraham. And then Paul says in verse 8, so I've been called upon to preach among the Gentiles what he calls, this is fascinating language, the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. He's preaching something that he says can't even be searched out or comprehended. He's making known that which is unsearchable. What does this mean? Paul, over and over again in all of his writings, but right here specifically, and he's about to do it again later on in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is making the point that the covenant promise of God, that is to say, the pledge of God's unconditional love for humanity, is not something that you can comprehend by logic alone. You can't make a propositional list of theological points and say, oh, I'm done with that task. Now I understand the love of God. Now I understand the character of God because I've mapped it out. I've diagrammed a sentence or something, and now I understand it. Paul says, no. The riches of the wealth of God's love that is in Christ, it is unknowable to the logical mind alone. That is not to negate the necessity of logic. I mean, we're engaging in a process of logic right now. We're engaging in deductive reasoning. We're saying point one, point two, point three. We're moving through a process of logical deduction. Logic isn't negated, but logic isn't enough. Logic isn't enough. Why? Because Paul will make this point again later, and that is this. The love of God can only be fully known by experience. By experience. By receiving and acknowledging his love for me and then beginning to act out the implications of his love toward others. So the more I behave or act in a manner consistent with the love of God toward me, 
The more through my very actions I will comprehend God's love. It will begin to be embedded in the muscle memory, if you will, of my experience. And at first it's awkward and at first it's even difficult, like practicing the violin for an hour or two a day under obligation to your parents on pain of not getting dinner if you don't finish practicing the violin. Well, at first, it's difficult, but after weeks and then months and then years, muscle memory takes over and you play the violin by second nature. It's just in you. By acting out the implications of the gospel in our love for others, we gradually become more and more habitually embedded in the patterns of God's relational dynamics, which are the relational dynamics of covenantal love. So Paul is saying you can never fully comprehend God's love by just searching it out logically, deductively, rationally. You've got to throw yourself into it. You've got to experience it. And you've got to act in accordance with it, and then it begins to take on significance. Then in verse 9, this is fascinating, he says that he is, is conducting this ministry to the Gentiles to make all see, to make all Gentiles, the whole world, anybody Paul can get their ear, get their attention, to make all see what is the, notice the language now, the fellowship of the mystery the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Notice that it is called first, as we've noticed, the mystery. Then Paul elongates the terminology and calls it the mystery of Christ. And now he says that this mystery of Christ is a mystery of fellowship. It is a mystery of of fellowship. This word fellowship is koinonia in the Greek, and it is one of the most beautiful words and one of the most meaningful words in the New Testament. It essentially means, koinonia means people doing life together, doing life together with unbroken communion. In other words, when you fail, you're not out. There is a redemptive process that occurs. When mistakes are noticed, while we overlook those mistakes, we allow our love to cover a multitude of sins, to quote scripture. When people fail, they're not cast off, they're embraced all the more, and they are nurtured and coached and walked through a process of redemptive love. Forgiveness kicks in. Mercy kicks in. Compassion kicks in. Sometimes it's just understanding that kicks in. Sometimes we don't see things exactly the same within the body of Christ. We have different perspectives on the same subject or idea or scripture or concept. We differ in our constitutions, in our makeup as human beings. We differ in our histories. We differ in our life's experience, and so we differ in our perception of things sometimes. And when we don't see something exactly the same, the gospel dictates that we don't walk away from one another. We, we draw close to one another, and we, we say, hey, hey, brother, hey, sister, help me understand your perspective. And even if you come to the conclusion that, hey, we don't fully agree on this point, we don't see this exactly the same, the gospel dictates that you remain in koinonia, you remain in fellowship with one another, and you keep doing the hard relational work of building bridges rather than walls. We engage in the challenging relational nuances of carrying one another's burdens in the areas we differ, when we fail, when we make mistakes. The koinonia is thereby a revelation 
to the world at large, which is where Paul goes next. He's making the point that you can know by experience what you cannot know by pure logic. So the koinonia, the fellowship, we come together and we do life real time on the stage of history by loving and forgiving and being patient and kind and saying, yeah, that didn't go exactly the way we intended it to go, but I love you still, I forgive you. Yes, I forgive you too. Let's go forward in fellowship. And that experience of koinonia, that experience of lived experience, that experience of doing life with others and continuing to remain in fellowship, well, it communicates on a level that pure logic can never achieve. To the intent, Paul says in verse 10, and now this is mind-blowing. Here Paul loops back to his cosmic picture of the atonement of Christ, which we looked at in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul had said that in the person of Christ, in the person of Christ, God has exercised a wisdom and prudence in his forgiveness of us, so that as the onlooking universe sees the way God is treating us, they love God all the more. Their trust in God is solidified so that all in heaven and earth, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 10, are unified in Christ as one. In chapter 1, he took in the entire universe of unfallen worlds, unfallen angels. And now he does it again. He says that this entire message of good news, this gospel, and how it is to be lived out in the body of Christ, how it is to be experienced in our relationships with one another, the koinonia of the church, the fellowship of the mystery, he says, is to the intent, okay, it has an end goal. It's aiming for something. To the intent that now, that is now, within the scope of what's happening by Christ in the church, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Again, there's his cosmic vision of the whole universe sitting in, as it were, and observing the, the proceedings of the great controversy between good and evil here on planet Earth. As Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage and we're the actors. Well, if all the world is a stage and we humans are the actors, who are those in the bleachers, as it were, spectating the unfolding of the act on the stage? while the unfallen worlds, unfallen angels, the principalities and powers in the heavenly realm are looking on and they are watching as God performs experiments of mercy and grace on human hearts. Transformations are occurring that are a wonder to heavenly beings. They see the patience and the love that is manifested by Christ to us and then by us to one another in the church. And as we relate to one another in the church with the koinonia of a fellowshipping love that remains a cohesive body, well, the whole unlooking universe, the principalities and powers in the heavenly realm look on and they're like, wow, look what is happening right there between that guy and that guy. Look at how Tom and David had this terrible misunderstanding between them and yet by the love of God, they surmounted the misunderstanding and remained in fellowship. Look how it is that Maria fell into sin and rather than being kicked to the curb, the church surrounded Maria and drew her in and moved through a redemptive process of forgiveness and reconciliation. And look, the heavenly universe says, 
The grace of God is so powerful that it produces a fellowship, a fellowship that is unbroken. This is amazing. It's understandable, isn't it? That unfallen worlds, that unfallen angels would look upon this world with all of its misery and destruction and death and say, hey, wait a minute. We probably should keep those people quarantined for all eternity. It's understandable, isn't it, that unfallen beings would look on to our world and say, we don't want them to spread the infection of selfishness throughout the whole universe. It's understandable that they would be looking for a display of grace and mercy, and love within the body of Christ that would give them the assurance that, hey, God's redemptive actions towards them were a manifestation of wisdom. It was a revelation of God's manifold wisdom to send forth Christ to be their Savior, and that manifold or multidimensional wisdom of God is revealed in the church in the way that you and I relate to one another? Will our relationships be sustained? Or will we continue to build walls instead of bridges? Will we continue to indulge in hostility and enmity toward one another so that the onlooking universe says, wow, whatever you do, don't let them loose in the universe to spread that kind of insanity and pain and misery to the whole universe. The manifold wisdom of God is on display in the church. But we might ask the question, what's wisdom got to do with it, right? Because if God is omnipotent, this is a very, very common line of reasoning, a very common question. If God is omnipotent, right? Why doesn't he just crush evil instantaneously the moment it raises its ugly head? Why go through any kind of long game? Just do the short game. You're God. You're powerful. Crush it. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. When you crush evil, when you crush sin, when you crush an irresponsible use of free will, The effect is to produce more rebellion, more evil, not less. Force is a short game and is not capable of producing long-term stability in the universe. But love is a long game because love operates by wisdom. The manifold wisdom of God is to say, listen, I'm going to take time with them, and that's called human history. Human history is God taking time with you and me to maneuver through, to navigate through all the relational, dysfunctional messiness of our individual experiences and our family dynamics and world history as a whole. And Jesus is the the crescendo point of human history where we see what it looks like for somebody to love like God loves in all directions. God to humans, human to God, human to human. Jesus is the omnidirectional revelation of relational integrity. And so this question of why doesn't God just use his power to crush evil short game in an instant. Well, Epicurus, the Greek philosopher who was very, very high on logic, and logic is a good thing, but notice his logic and notice what's missing from his logic. This is some 300 years before the time of Christ. Epicurus, the Greek philosopher said, either God wants to abolish evil and cannot, that's option number one according to Epicurus, or he can, abolish evil, that is, but doesn't want to, then he says, if God wants to, that is, abolish evil, but cannot, well, then he is powerless. But if God can abolish evil, but he doesn't want to, well, then he's wicked. Do you see 
what Epicurus is doing. I mean, it's sound logic. It's like a pros and cons list and quoting a Bible verse and wondering why everybody doesn't want to get with your program. Because life is more than sheer logic. Relationships are more complex than pure rationality. And what is missing from the logic of Epicurus is love. It never occurs to him. He simply says, if God's all powerful, why does evil exist? Why doesn't he just crush it? And if he doesn't crush it, he must be okay with it. And if he's okay with it, well, then he's wicked. So why would you want anything to do with a God who wants wickedness and evil and all the suffering it entails? Why would you want anything to do with a God who wants evil and suffering to exist? But what's missing here is the simple fact. Now watch this. He goes on and he says, if God can abolish evil and he really wants to, then he poses finally a question. So there's a, there's a note of humility. He asks a question, why is there evil in the world? He never answers his own question because he doesn't know the answer. Because logic in its pure form, apart from any other factor, can't answer the question. So, so what is the answer? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that Paul is building a case for the fact that love is the highest form of wisdom. Now, love entails logic, but not logic alone. The wisdom of God is to love you and me, even though we have rebelled against him. And in loving us, God is revealing to us the necessary relational dynamic that would allow us to repent and return to him, here's the key word, voluntarily, by our free will, under no obligation to do so, and yet we want to because we see in God that which is worthy of our return to him. So think about it like this. God basically had just a few possible options, right? God could either create nothing. Well, that's really not an option for God because God is love. Love is relational by nature. Love is other-centered. Therefore, God, who is love, had this strong, overwhelming impulse, this creative impulse to make others to love and to love like he loves. So... God could create nothing, or God could have said, okay, I'm going to save myself all the pain and complexity and messiness by just creating machines. God could have created mechanized beings. I don't think you could even call them beings, certainly not persons. God could have created, what do we call it today, artificial intelligence. God could have created machines. Or God could have created slaves. He could have created people with free will, but continually exert force so that they comply nanosecond by nanosecond to his will. But there is a fourth option, and that is that God could create free moral agents. And that is the option God chose. Why? Because the end goal if it is love, necessitates that freedom is the only way to get there. So if God's end goal is love between us and him and between us and one another, well then there's only one way to get to that end goal and that is to create a world in which, to create beings in which there is legitimate free will. And free will has the risk of going in one of two directions. If I'm free to say yes, I'm free to say no. On the other hand, if the end goal is merely control and the absence of any inconvenience or pain or suffering, if the end goal is just sheer control, well, then force is an option. But God's end goal isn't control, so for God, force is not an option. Well, Paul goes on 
And he says that all of this that God has enacted in the person of Christ is according to God's own eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Eternal purpose. That's long game. I mean, that's really long game. God has always operated by these principles. Love is the only eternally sustainable principle. And God's eternal purpose was always to have a world and a universe in which love alone is the governing principle. And so God is working a long game plan with you in mind, with me in mind, and he's doing it with manifold wisdom so that the church becomes a, a point of revelation to the world and the universe of what the love of God is capable of achieving. In verses 14 and 15, he says in this context now, he's built this entire beautiful picture and now he's gonna pray. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth takes its name. Notice again his cosmic scope of vision. There is the heavens, which are populated, and then there's earth, which is populated. There are unfallen worlds and unfallen angels, and there are fallen human beings. And the whole family of God, which includes heavenly beings and human beings. All of the family of heaven and earth takes its name from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who has created stability and security for the universe at large, not just for planet earth. So he bows his knees and he prays for you and me that he would grant you, that God would grant you, it's a petitionary prayer, he wants something. Paul prays that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, according to the wealth of the goodness of God's character, according to the riches of what is in God to do. He prays that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Paul perceives that human beings are composed of essentially or at least two parts. There's the inner person and the outer person. The outer person is the body and the actions we perform with our bodies. But the inner person, the inner person is the entire psychological makeup of the person that dictates the actions of the outer person, of the body's behaviors. And so Paul goes to the inner person. He prays that we would be strengthened with might by God's spirit in the inner person. And what is the source of this strength? That Christ may dwell, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Jesus taking up residence, not as a, a physical entity, a little miniature Jesus uh, literally existing in our own brains or bodies, but Christ inhabiting our hearts by a very specific means that you, he explains, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I know that's a mouthful. Paul is essentially saying to you and to me that God's love is multidimensional. It has height and depth and width and length. And the, the more we comprehend God's love, through our whole experience as a human being, the more it will transform us and manifest in our relationships with others. And then he closes his prayer in Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, that's a mouthful, exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even think or imagine according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. Again, the church is the medium of revelation. The way we relate to one another within the body of Christ speaks to the world and to the universe of the gospel.
It tells the world and the universe that there's something beautiful and good going on over there. That's where people are patient with one another. That's where people go through a process of remaining in koinonia, in fellowship. So Paul's prayer is for, number one, internal empowerment by means of God's love as the power, as the, the very strength that we need in the inner person through comprehension. Comprehension is the medium by which God's love enters our hearts and minds and lives. And this, Paul says, is the power that works in us. Love begets love. That's the message of the gospel. The love of God manifested in Christ gives birth to a like responsive love in me, in you, in our individual relationships and experience. Allow the manifold wisdom of God to be put on display in your life, in my life, in our life together as the church of Christ. The fellowship that we have with one another that is characterized by covenantal faithfulness, that is characterized by patience, that is characterized by mercy, that is characterized by redemptive process. It is that love that says to the world and to the universe that Jesus is worth knowing, that God is worth knowing. And by our lives, we thereby invite people into fellowship with Christ, with us, as a part of the entire family that includes every man, woman, and child, our brothers, our sisters, those whom Jesus, by his shed blood, has redeemed. You and I, you and I are called to power dynamics of love, not power dynamics of rejection, and hostility, not power dynamics of force, power dynamics of love. That young man wanted to be married something fierce, but his methodology was failing him over and over again. There was logic to it, but what was missing was love. Love is the highest form of logic. Please pray with me over Ephesians chapter 3. Father in heaven, thank you that you have loved us in Christ with a love that is beyond our comprehension and yet we can experience it. Thank you for the good God that you are and for all you have achieved on our behalf. May we remain in fellowship with one another and work out our differences. Do the hard and messy relational work of mercy and forgiveness and patience. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.